we're going to talk about intracranial bleeding. Uh, it can be epidural or subdural. So when we have an epidural hemorrhage, we have bleeding between the dura and the skull, the dura being the outer part of the meninges. Uh, normally the dura is stuck pretty well to the skull, so because of the trauma the dura gets pulled away, but you have just the area where the dura pulled away that the bleeding happens. It doesn't spread out usually very far, but that also means you get more force in that limited area pushing down against the brain. Usually bleeding is arterial, if you're talking about epidural. Um, what tears in there is arteries, which means the bleeding happens quite fast. And so the brain compression usually happens quite quickly. Not always, however. Uh, someone can actually be symptom free for up to 48 hours. Most commonly they get up and say, oh gosh, I'm okay, and then very quickly they're not okay. Now this is not common in children under four years of age. Usually, um, you know, they're a little older. Subdural hematoma, this is bleeding down below the dura, between the dura and uh, your actual brain, the cerebrum. And usually this is venous. Usually this is the cortical veins that have been uh, severed. This is going to develop slowly and because you have a normal space here, the blood can spread out quite thinly and widely. So you don't get that pushing down on just one area, you get a much wider area. This is uh, unfortunately a fairly common birth trauma and infants where this happens at birth um, have a high mortality and even if they do survive usually a um, prognosis can be quite poor. We'll see developmental retardation so they're not meeting those developmental milestones and usually failure to thrive as well. They don't grow well. Um, if we know you know this is caught quickly enough they can be treated with a subdural tap, so they'll insert a needle um, down into that subdural space and aspirate out the blood. Uh, if that doesn't work, or in older children where the sutures are, are fused, then it needs surgical evacuation to get that blood out. And here's our pictures. Here's the dura here, and we have this epidural hematoma here because it's between the skull and the dura. Still is able to push on the brain to the point that it pushes some of the brain matter down into the tutorium here, um, which will pinch off the blood supply to the brain. So this can lead to brain death. Here's our subdural. So you can see the dura is still up here, and this is in that space between the dura and the brain, so it tends to be bigger, um, but you still can have the same amount of, of force pushing on it that you can end up with herniation, and herniation um, is very serious, usually will lead to death. Cerebral edema, when you have a, some sort of head trauma, you're big concern is cerebral edema that can increase for 24 to 72 hours after the injury. Just think of any injury. We um, get that increased capillary permeability, leaky capillaries, and we're sending more blood there to try and bring those white cells and things that phagocytize, and so we get edema that increases for up to 72 hours. That's normal in an injury. It happens just the same in the brain. The problem is this can then lead to vascular stasis, can cause or worsen anorexia, uh, sorry, uh, anoxia, lack of oxygen to the tissues there, um, and cause further vasodilation. Now when the pressure inside of the skull, the ICP, when that exceeds the arterial blood pressure we are not going to get blood circulation to the brain, right? 
blood is not going to push into an area that's at higher pressure than the pressure we're using to push the blood. So um, ICP monitoring, uh, we're comparing that to pressure. And usually they'll use that MAP, the mean art, uh, arterial pressure, uh, which is the average between the systolic and the diastolic, but um, skewing it for the amount of time mm -hmm. that you're at the systolic pressure versus the diastolic pressure. So anyway, we're comparing the MAP to your ICP and when that ICP gets high enough we're not going to have blood flow to the brain. It can also get high enough that it causes herniation. It pushes brain down into that opening at the brain stem. When you're um, treating someone with a head trauma need, you need to always think ABC and include S, ABCS. We normally do the ABCs, and I know if you've done CPR recently, they changed the order of these, but for a head trauma, we still really want to go in that ABC order. We want to make sure there's an airway and that they're breathing, and then worry about the circulation, because with kids, airway and breathing come first. That's what, what happens in kids. And then we always want to be careful of that spine, though. We don't want to move them their neck or their their spine until we've ruled out particularly a, a cervical spine injury fracture. We're going to be doing x-rays of the skull. We're not going to be doing an LP. When you do an LP, you're taking that CSF fluid off from around the spinal cord, so you're lowering the pressure down around the spinal cord, and if you have high pressure inside the brain, we have just allowed herniation to happen. The brain pushing down through the tentorium at the base of the skull there. Um, and that usually leads to death. Now with an infant we can do a subdural tap. So we're tapping um, through either the fontanelle or the suture line of the brain into that subdural uh, space the arachnoid space and drawing out any fluid. So we're taking off pressure that's pushing down on the brain. We're not taking off pressure below like with an LP. Hopefully that makes sense. If we have any discharge coming out of the nose, we want to check it for glucose. Use that dipstick that checks for glucose because if it has glucose, it's probably CSF fluid, not just nasal discharge. Post-traumatic syndromes. This is not post-traumatic stress that people have after they go through a stressful event. This is seizures after injury to the brain. And it can occur anywhere from minutes to hours after an injury. The problem can last for days to months. And children can still have post-traumatic seizures up to two years after the injury occurred. What we're going to see in these post-traumatic stress or post-traumatic syndromes, um, you can see for infants, pallor, sweating, irritability, sleepiness, and vomiting, possibly. In children, we're going to get behavioral disturbances, sleep disturbances, phobias, emotional liability, um, switching from one to the other quickly. Uh, irritability, changes in school performance, seizures, and then in adolescence, headaches, dizziness, impaired concentration. So how do we manage um, head traumas? Well, if we have a mild to a moderate concussion, we're going to send this kid home. What we're going to tell the parents is they need to wake the child up every two hours. And you'll hear people say, oh, don't let the child sleep they have to sleep. We have to let them sleep. We're not going to keep them up for, you know, 24 hours or more, but we want to make sure there's no change in level of consciousness, and the only way we can know that is by waking them up every two hours. We expect them to be sleepy. We expect them to be groggy and grumpy when we wake them up, but we also expect them to know who they are and where they are and um, not 
talk with slurred speech, not say things that make no sense. Um, they need to be able to have a normal level of consciousness every two hours when they're woken up. And remember, that's because we said that um, an epidural hematoma, epidural uh, bleed, we may not see signs right away. Now, the younger a child is, the um, just the more resilient they are, including their brain. So even a major intracranial trauma, children who are, or infants really, infants and toddlers, less than 24 months, recover much better than children who are older or especially than adults.